since I was, I think, 11 years old and I started off playing, playing the guitar and I uh, just always loved, loved music and eventually, like somewhere around 19, I decided to pick up the bass and what we have here is, in fact, actually an electric bass and we're going to talk about, basically, how this instrument completely relates to our discussion today on inductance magnetic inductance specifically, as well as the element that we're working with within uh, circuits one right now, the inductor itself. But this instrument, in ju just like, how, how should I say it, many other things within our society is engineered in such a way to, to essentially you know, perform a specific function. And most of the time with engineering, we think of that function as being something that we build within a factory or some service that we provide within society. But in, in this case, this magnificent piece of engineering right here was actually made in such a way so that we could actually enjoy music way more. Now, how does this deal with inductance? Well, this instrument here, years and, de uh, years, and years ago, actually decades ago, somebody decided that acoustic instruments weren't basically loud enough and that you could reach more people uh, in a single concert hall if you actually had something to amplify that signal. And so an instrument like this, which this is in fact actually a five string electric bass, this one right here, if we unplugged it, we would not be able to hear hardly any, any of it. So what happened was, and what was designed, was basically this idea of taking, you know, the, what we call these, these are pickups right here, and within these two pickups, each of them have five permanent, magnet, uh, permanent magnets. And each of them sit there and just basically produce a permanent magnetic field. And that permanent magnetic field doesn't really want to be messed with at all. In fact, actually, with, with the permanent magnetic field sitting there by itself and nothing disturbing it, this instrument produces absolutely zero volts whatsoever. But through the law of magnetic induction, which basically states as you take a closed loop conductor and then move it through a permanent magnetic field, you actually induce a current. Well, conversely, if we have a permanent, permanent magnetic field and we disturb it, in this case we're actually disturbing it with steel strings, then essentially what we do is cause that magnetic field to want to compensate for that change. And the way it compensates is by producing basically a voltage that is directly proportional to all of the fundamental frequencies, har har uh, harmonics, and overtones of the string. And there you go, you got a low B right there, actually B flat. But in this case, guys, what happens is, is that 0.8 volts of this periodic, periodic signal, or any signal that, that comes out of this instrument, basically gets put into an amplifier and then literally amplified into such a voltage, big, bigger voltage, that we can actually use to drive, well, another inductive load, which is what a speaker is. So, how does this relate to essentially not only what we're talking about today, but also ju just the inductor itself? Well, let me put this down real quick. Oh. Well. You guys have, have been around inductance your whole lives, and not, and, not just with, and not just with music production, but our entire society is basically dependent upon 
magnetic inductance. Anything from power generation all the way through power transmission, through taking that signal once it gets to your house, and then stepping it down to something very, very, very small that, that we can actually, well, relatively small, that we can actually utilize in order to basically power our house. And you've also been dealing with with uh, inductors also through basically these little guys, which is basically a plug in my iPhone to this thing. And it also steps, steps down that voltage in such a small way and converts it into what we call, uh, from an AC signal to a DC signal so that we can actually charge our iPhone or Android or whatever. But what is, what is the inductor? Well, the inductor itself is, is nothing more than basically uh, either what we call uh, ferrous or uh, magnetized core and basically surround it with thousands of turns of wire and what this thing basically does is that it retards essentially the flow of current as current starts to go to this element a permanent magnetic field starts to build and it gradually builds in such a way that that it, it holds back that flow of current and then as that magnetic field builds it eventually gets to the point where it basically sits in a steady state in which the, the magnetic field doesn't, doesn't change anymore and then all of a sudden just allows for the passing of current through it. A good example of this is anytime you guys see anybody at Chat State turn on an overhead projector, um, basically so, and we do this all the time with an, with a 213 or Cat79, that projector doesn't immediately just show the image from the computer. It's, it gradually warms up and we, and we warm it up to make sure that bulb does not burst with it within that projector itself. And so we utilize an inductor to basically slowly allow for current to actually go through that bulb so that we actually can continually use that thing instead of actually blowing up that bulb and having to replace it. But the inductor itself, a ferrous core here, and sometimes also what we call an air core, and just thousands of turns of wires and that current flows in, builds this magnetic field and as that magnetic field then uh, gradually allows for the flow of current and usually does at least in a resistive inductive circuit with basically uh, essentially an exponential type of, type of form or response. But inductance itself and it's actually given, given the unit of Henry basically from Joseph Henry, uh, who actually discovered inductance. So it's actually determined within that element by basically N squared times the permeability of, of that uh, core itself, which means its ability, it's a characteristic and, uh, and value of, it, of its ability to be magnetized multiplied by its cross-sectional area and then divided by its length. So basically the more turns that we have, and then the more ability that, that we actually have to magnetize that core and its cross-sectional area, the bigger the inductance value that we actually get. And it's also ability to store energy within that magnetic field is actually more. But how do we actually relate this? Now, now we said before with the capacitor that the current through the capacitor actually basically pushed charge onto the anode and the cathode. And so that caused essentially a gradual change in terms of the voltage. Well, with the inductor, the inductor actually does it a little bit backwards in such a way. So, as long as the current is changing, and as long as the magnetic field is changing within, you know, across that element, then we actually have a voltage that's truly applied. Or, in other words, the voltage across the element is actually dependent upon that current actually changing as well as the magnetic, ma magnetic field changing. And as that magnetic field basically becomes stable, becomes into a steady state, then we actually see that that voltage eventually goes to zero. So in steady state, where we modeled that capacitor as an open circuit with the inductor, we actually, in, I'm going to say ideal, we ideally model it as basically a short circuit. Now, I say ideally for a very specific reason, we're going to allow the Circus 2 guys to learn about that next semester.
It's mainly mainly due to the resistance within the wire, especially when we have thousands of turns of wire. But we're not going to worry about that here. So again, the voltage across that inductor is dependent upon its inductance value as well as basically that change in that current as it flows through that element. And this right here, guys, just like the capacitor, is actually a differential equation. That model, this current voltage characteristic, is in fact actually a differential equation. And the response to that, because its combination with a resistor within a circuit does form basically a first order differential equation, the response to it is very, very, very similar to that of a resistive capacitive circuit. But two things are actually different. The, the, instead of having voltage for the response, we actually have the current through it that's of the same form. Basically, ILT is equal to the steady state condition of that current flowing through it. And then basically added on to its transient portion or, the, or basically its exponential portion. And I left off one specific thing here. So basically, I of infinity plus the coefficient of the exponential, I, I naught, or the initial condition, minus the final condition multiplied by e to the negative t divided by tau. Now tau for the, as the time constant for, for basically that resistive capacitive circuit is actually different than the resistive inductive circuit. And for here, that time constant, instead of being R times C, is actually L divided by R Thevenin. And we actually get that directly from the differential equation and also mainly the characteristic equation uh, that determines the roots of the response. In this case, we once again, first order differential equation, we just have one singular root. So, very similarly to the way that we analyze resistive capacitive circuits, here we're actually looking at a resistive inductive circuit, and instead of finding a voltage across a resistor, we're actually going to be looking for the current through one that is generally going to be in series with that inductor. So, three things that, that you guys will actually find within these problems are basically an initial current through the inductor, a final current through the inductor, and then the equivalent resistance that that inductor actually sees, sees that actually drives that response. So, for here, I modified problem 7.59 just a little bit to, to basically help you guys out, because uh, I didn't want to, want to talk about step function, I want to keep with something that you guys have already seen right now. So, here, step function is nothing more than essentially a mathematical switch, but I want to actually use a real switch. So, for this one, just like in one of the examples that we had for the resistive capacitive circuit, uh, I've just left basically the switch open and nothing's, nothing's going on until we actually close this switch. So for here guys, the initial condition for the current through that inductor is actually just zero amps. So as we close that switch down, we actually change the circuit, then we actually provide an excitation that actually will drive current to that inductor itself. And then that's when we actually will start seeing that change within the flow of current through that element. So let's go ahead and just look at the final state or steady state condition of, of, that, in, of that inductor's current at t is equal to infinity. And it's very, very simple. Just, just as like what we've done before in chapter two, we basically collapse the circuit down into one single loop in which we actually would find the current leaving the 18 volt source and from here, we would de uh, determine that that current was equal to 2.33 amps. And then simply because the 3 ohm resistor is actually essentially in parallel due to the 4 ohm resistor, which is due to the nature of that inductor actually in steady state act acting like a short circuit, then we actually get 2.33 and then by current division multiplied by the proportion of 3 over 3 plus 4 and that gives us 1 amp for the final state of the current flowing through that element. Now I, I said something that I forgot to mention earlier is that in steady state this element actually works like a short circuit as opposed to open circuit. As the change goes to zero the voltage goes to zero and we know that zero volts is always modeled with a short circuit. Now, 
So for this one, the initial condition was zero amps. The final condition was equal to one amp. Now for the time constant, just like we, just like we did with the capacitor, we're going to be equating the resistance to the element. So basically we turn off the source. So voltage source goes to zero. We model that as a short. And then, and if we had a current source, it would basically go to zero amps and act like an open circuit. So here we would actually equate the resistance to that inductor. And in this case, because we're breaking down and collapsing the resistance to that inductor, because of the nature of turning off that voltage source, we have six in parallel with three. And then that actually causes that equivalence to become in series with that four ohm resistor. And so Ta, the time constant being equal to L over R thevenin, would actually give us simply 0.25 seconds. And so the total response for the, for the current through the inductor is actually just going to be by the same form of a first order response. It's just going to be equal to the final condition of one amp subtracted from one amp multiplied by e to the negative t divided by 0.25 amps. All right, so guys, that's an introduction to inductors and a simple problem that, we're, that, that, that we can utilize to kind of understand how we actually analyze these circuits. We're going to continually discuss problems like this, and more is going to come along the way. All right, see you guys in a bit.